Okay. Um, <clears throat> so we, we, we start with uh, uh, a, a presentation by Dr. Seema Singh. Um, uh, Seema is a journalist and a founder of the Ken, a digital publication. Uh, she has over two decades of uh, experience in journalism. Before starting the Ken, she wrote uh, Myth Breaker, Kiran Majumdar Shaw and the Story of Indian Biotech, uh, which was published by Harper Collins in 2016. Earlier, she has worked as a senior editor uh, in the, in, with Forbes India and written for the Mint. And um, so she's written for numerous international publications like IEEE Spectrum, New Scientist, Cell, and Newsweek. Uh, Seema is a, a Knight Science Journalism Fellow from the MIT and a MacArthur Foundation Research Trainee. So I'll request her to uh, make a presentation for roughly 10 minutes, and then we go on to the next one. Thank you, Dr. Shastri, for that introduction, and thank you, Academy, for organizing this and having me here. It's a privilege. And it's interesting because uh, I think this is 10 years too late because Professor Balram is here and he would remember that I would have several conversations with him and I would urge him to make you know, articles on current science website, not as PDFs, but open to discussion and comments and, and all that. So great that finally this is, this is getting started and you have, you have a journalist among you to you know, share some views. I know it's a little outrageous to say this in front of this audience, you know, atoms, uh, not atoms, but stories. Uh, Muriel Rukeyser was an American poet who passed away in 1980. She used to write on equality and social justice. So uh, it's just to make a point, and the point is, uh, you know, that science beautifully lends itself to storytelling. Each story has a plot, starts with a question, has several questions along the way, there are you know, little revelations, may end with an answer, may not end with an answer, may end with a lot more questions. All this you know, make for a really good storytelling sort of you know, technique and subject matter. But I'm really surprised in my 20 years of journalism that I really found that scientists were just not willing to do that. So you know, I'm, I'm sort of you know, still intrigued that why having you know, such a subject at their, uh, you know, in their profession, they've shied away from, from this art. Story is overdue. Peter Hager is interesting that he says this because AAAS, uh, I think, is one of the most well-organized science communication sort of, you know, and also well-oiled science communication machinery. They do it very well. They run several media fellowships, and they have a very good record of having those fellows come back into science writing and science, science journalism. So when he says that you know, science, scientists are overdue in communication or in engaging with the public, and he thinks that 10% of your time should go for that, I'd be very keen to know, you know, once probably dialogue gets started and you do some baseline surveys to figure out how do Indian scientists feel about it? Is it like really time taken away from their work? You know, so because we have no data, we don't do these surveys as Professor Balram showed in his presentation. We have no idea what scientists think about it. The second quote is from Fields medalist Vladimir, who unfortunately died just a few days ago uh, uh, in Princeton, unfortunate age of like 51. And he says that, you know, today new people find it harder and harder to engage in scientific process. I think it's a bad sign. I don't think the first leads to the second. It would be simplistic to say that. But I think there is a, there's a correlation. That because the first is not happening, probably the second, you know, people like him and so many others feel that it's, it's getting harder to even get good students into science and, and think about science. I won't go into this because all three uh, previous speakers spoke very well about, uh, you know, very nicely and with a with lot of uh, examples and all. But I was very happy to see the document which the Academy has now presented before the Prime Minister. Two very interesting sort of, you know, points there. One was uh, that basic science applied and translational, all three of them were mentioned, and all three should get uh, equal attention, which is important because translational science has been frowned upon for years, and not just here, it's even in the West. 
even as recent as like last week, uh, Bob Langer at MIT was sort of talking about it in one of the podcasts. Basic science, I think, is is in need of uh, you know, is in need of a new narrative, is in need of renewed advocacy. Why? Because I think again, it's from from my experience that scientists have not been able to convey the larger picture that emerges, uh, you know, from undirectional blue sky kind of science. And I don't think anybody can do that on their behalf other than scientists themselves. And I just want to, the trackpad doesn't work. Anyway, it was just a graph from, you know, Carl Dyseroth's uh, work on optogenetics, and he was here two years ago uh, giving a TNQ lecture. Professor Balram introduced him. I was so intrigued by his work and Professor Balram's introduction that I went back and I did some reading on him. And I found this graph. It's you must look up. It's on, you know, if you Google Stanford and his name, you'll find it. It's an amazing graph which shows that how it took almost 45 years of basics research and publication to get that spike in, you know, where both clinical work and more publication in rhodopsin and bacterial rhodopsin actually started happening and people actually discovered that optogenetics has, uh, you know, a practical application. So, you know, to give that kind of story to whether it's policymakers or the people you interact with or journalists, like Professor Balram said, media is the problem. I accept that, you know, that thing on behalf of my, my tribe. But, you know, th there, is, there is a lack, you know, of either excitement or effort, you know, in communicating those kinds of stories. And I'm sure all of you, when you go back, you know, in your work, in your field, and you put some effort to put together those kinds of stories, you know, that, or for example, RNA, you know, how people were looking for, you know, good purple color in petunia and how this branch of uh, biotech came up, which is probably the third generation of biotech drugs. But it took so many years. So probably we need to, you know, dig up some more such stories and tell those stories to people to sort of make them buy into the idea of funding basic science. I won't go into this because both Professor Balram and Professor Narsimha talked about the role of science. Effective communication, yes. So far, what we have is just two kinds of communication. One is peer-to-peer, -peer, what you have, you write for each other, fellow scientists and technologists. Second is for the lay audience. And I would argue now that you're getting into you know, an online uh, thing that there's nothing like lay audience, like one size fits all. Society has different layers of people and different people con sort of consume scientific information in different ways and at different levels and at different levels of utility. So, you know, as you, as you, as you design your program, you should, uh, you know, probably keep that in mind. I think we, what we sort of miss in this country is a narrative of science, you know. Unlike the economic narrative of the country, we don't have a dominant science narrative of the country. I mean, even today, a 15-year-old, if you ask him or her, you know, they can talk about 91, pre-liberalization, India before 91 and after. By and large, they know something. But if you ask them anything about science, you know, 50 years, 60 years, and with no sort of, you know, specific field, just a general perception that what does it look like, I don't think anybody, even an adult, will find it hard to actually speak something about it. And as a journalist, I have not found one place, one repository where I can go and I can find something which I think is, 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 really, uh, is, is really unfortunate that we have so many academies, but there's no common, even if you take STEM, you know, the fact that so many people are engaged in the STEM economy, which is nicely branded as science, technology, engineering, and math, leaving aside the economic side of it, if, if I want to know how many people are employed in STEM economy, how many people are facing challenges, how many people need to uh, you know, reskill themselves given the challenges facing this, this sector. 
Professor Balram said, and Professor Narsimha said that you know funding has stagnated at 0.8 percent of GDP because probably policymakers don't see a good return on investment in science. Why would we not communicate that this is what the contribution of STEM community in the economy? Unless you make some effort to document and communicate that, why would anybody care? It's like, you know, let's just go on with 8%, even though in absolute numbers probably the budget is more because the economy has grown much bigger. But percentage of GDP, it has remained the same. So probably, you know, once now that you're getting into all this, probably we would, you know, as, as members of civil society we would want to see, I mean, I've been, uh, you know, going from one side to the other to figure out some numbers on this. I have never found any. And it's surprising because in climate science and ecology, we've had a very, very good effort from the entire community, both in India and abroad. So rest of the science, I don't know what's, what sort of holding them back. And if, the, if you don't give the narrative you know, as we see very today, you leave people with, you know, all choices and opportunities to fill the space with their narratives, and it can just start with a WhatsApp forward. It goes to 200 million people, all kinds of pseudo stories, and then it's like genies out of the bottle. So how much time do I have? So for a long time, we discussed, you know, whether scientists should talk about their research, try to influence <laughs> policy, you know, it's not, it's not compatible with their work because they're supposed to be neutral. I think we are past that. And the question today is not if they should do it, but how they should do it and how wisely they should do it. So, you know, when you, when you sort of go live in January and when you have confluence and exchange, please design your activities and programs so that, you know, you... You facilitate an exchange, and not like you know a talk, a top-down or a talk-down approach. With Abhijit Banerjee talks about you know he, he does a lot of work on poverty and travels widely, engages a lot with uh, you know people in in real, real, real abject poverty, and you know talk to the poor, don't talk down. He says, and this is you know a tweet I sort of insert, which I was having a conversation with one of uh, my fellow. A journalist, she's uh, you know a BTEC from uh, IIT Madras. is based out of Boston, and even there she faces this. So it's a global kind of a thing. I'm not saying only Indian scientists do this; they talk down. It's global, but I think it's a little more. It's a little more in India. I'll have to I'll have to say that. And again, outcome of dialogue. Once you do this, probably uh, you know if if there's a clear. Uh, objective in mind that can I measure myself, uh, what has come out of it, how has it, uh, you know, changed the narrative or changed the dialogue, changed the exchange, that would be better because, again, as a country, we are very poor on data collection and data dissemination. Assumptions. You know, again, one of the slides had this, that, you know, the more you engage with the public, the more funding you have for people. Incidentally, uh, science communication literature <laughs> in the U.S., uh, does not support this. And it's not surprising because, uh, and it's not unique to science because p political voters, you see, uh, you know, they are not, I mean, there's a lot of political communication, but they're not greatly informed. Otherwise, they wouldn't have selected Trump, uh, I mean, elected Trump. So uh, it's, it's common. Current practice, what we have again today is, this is, this ought to be communicated to the, to the audience, and this is how we'll do it. I think what should be done is like, what does the community want to know? Can we find ways to make that knowledge available and accessible? So probably, you know, sort of deviation from, from the current uh, practice. And again, as I said earlier, we, we really need to have some baseline data to, to begin with as you start your uh, new venture. Some caveats because, and this is again, Professor Balram also had it on his uh, on his presentation. He had the quote from the DSD secretary. I have it here from the minister, and I know this is being recorded uh, and live uh, telecast. But still, you know, uh, there's a there's a big risk here that you know we may go from no communication to hyper communication. We do a lot of things as ministers, but people do not get to know about them. I don't think dialogue is being launched to do that. Right, so uh, let let nobody hijack your 
your sort of conversation and your narrative into, into something uh, else. And again, a caveat here is that which Professor Balram said, media is the problem, and he had a couple of things, I, I admit. Journalists, you know, as writers, we know we look for, if you give us five stories, I'll choose a story which I want to tell, right, which my audience would want. And as I said, you know, we have, we have different sections in the audience. You have to target your writing. And all of you, when you write your stories, your uh, communications, it has to be for a targeted, intended audience. So when I write, I choose a story. But then journalists look for outliers. But for the general, you know, when you all write for your, you know, this exchange or for, for confluence, you know, it's good to remember that the average is a good statistical tool. You don't have to go for outliers, you know, you're, you're free to write, write all kinds of stories. So the outliers is, is, is for the media. And again, as somebody said that we should apply the same intellectual rigor to communication. It should not be an afterthought. My submission is just this, that by and large, the public today really, really trusts academics and scientists. There's, there's no sort of big trust deficit here. And as, as you go sort of into this sort of, you know, really head along into public engagement and all that, please remember the lesson from the mainstream media, which until a few years ago really did enjoy you know, trust and support of, of the public, and they dug their own grave and, you know, where they are. So, uh, you know, keeping that trust uh, alive is, is very, and intact is very important. And in some cases, you know, I can say from experience that even when I would write uh, and my fellow journalists would write, in some, in some segments you really crave independent viewpoint. For example, nuclear energy. You know, where you don't know where is the government, where is the agency, where is the media, they all are on the same side of the table, and you don't know who to go to to ask for a, you know, an honest, on, honest opinion. Someone in Delhi said, we are launching a science tech portal. Someone who runs a, you know, a digital uh, publication and an online thing, I can tell you that there's huge pressure to produce more content cheaply and quickly. And that can be really, really a self-defeating purpose because the demands of this. Uh, so, like you know, I was talking to uh, Dr. Meva Singh, and he said that you know, as and when things will, uh, you know, stories or articles will come, they'll publish. They don't have a schedule, uh, kind of a thing. So it's, you know, let's not get down to the pressures of the actual digital world, which is like really, really uh, uh, bad. And what is good for a political establishment may not be good for the science. Thank you so much. Thank you. <clears throat> so I next uh, call upon um, Sundar Sarakai uh, to, to uh, make uh, his opening remarks. Uh, Sundar is currently a professor of philosophy at the National Institute of Advan Advanced Studies. Uh, he's the author of several books, uh, many of them pertaining to science, uh, translating the world, science and language, philosophy of symmetry, philosophy and philosophy of science, uh, experience and theory. This is a book that's uh, co-edited with Gopal, sorry, I, I'm sorry, The Cracked Mirror, An Indian Debate on Experience and Theory. This is a book that's co-authored by uh, Sundar and, and uh, Gopal Guru. Uh, he's in a Editorial Advisory Board member of the Leonardo Book Series on Science and Art, published by MIT Press, the series editor for Science and Technology Studies, Rutledge, and the chief editor of the Springer Handbook on Logical Thought in India. Uh, through his writing, Sundar Sarukai has explored several aspects of science, philosophy, and culture. In addition to his scholarly works, uh, Sundar Sarukai also writes as a columnist in the Hindu and other newspapers. Uh, on a wide ranging topic, uh, a wide range of topics. So I uh, request now Sundar to uh, make his opening remarks. Thank you, Mr. Kant. It's a great honor and pleasure to be here. Um, I can't speak, I can't really stand in for Professor Gadakkar, and I tried my best to resist, but uh, the persuasive skills of uh, Srikant and Ram are as good as their science, and so I'm here. Um, I'm very glad I'm here, and part of the reason why um, <clears throat> I was resisting in a little uh, sense was because 
Um, you know, I wrote a piece in the Hindu sometime back after the march, and I know there are some people here who probably do not look very kindly to that piece. We have had, to put it mildly, so we had some debate around it. Um, but then I also realized, you know, following that, we've been having a lot of discussion with uh, Srikanth and others, and I realized there is a, there's a very important need to be able to communicate this kind of a struggle we have between those of us who are outside this tribe of scientists and the way in which the remaining part of the society, where your science and society part, is, is looking at science and scientists. And in a small measure, I speak for that group, which is looking outside at this tribe of scientists who are sitting all around me. And I'm sure she will do a far better job and more exhaustive one after this. Um, I wanted to, and, and also I must uh, say that I did um, tell Srikanth that I'll try and be as polite as possible after my, you know, the debate on the Hindu peace. So I will, I, I, I'm just going to focus on one, one simple question, which I think is the root cause of this uh, debate about science and society. And part of it is, is primarily this. Why is it that scientists as a community, and I'm generalizing, but I'm sure you'll grant me that a little bit here in the 10 minutes. Why is it that scientists as a society have or react as if reflections on science, critical reflections of science, not criticisms of science, critical reflections on science are often seen to be anti-science. This actually raises a very simple question. We understand the question of science and society is very central because science is anyway a social commodity. It's a social, uh, so for us, if you want to look at the question of science, I would look at what is what we would call as a sociality of science, which is essential to it. And scientists may abstract parts of the sociality of science into ideal pictures of science. And at one level, the conflict is scientists and those who are talking about the larger picture of science are actually not talking about the same thing at all. And this is a deep problem about language as such. So on the one hand, we have scientists talking about science. On the other hand, many of us who are invoking the word science are actually talking about something else quite different from what many of you talk or refer to when you use the word science. So the, simple, so the simpler question in this context is this. Who should we really be talking about science and society? Or what skills, we could rephrase it to ask, what skills do you need to talk about science and society? Obviously, if you need skills to talk about condensed matter physics or astrophysics or organic chemistry or whatever, in the same sense, if you want to look at this relationship between science and society, what kind of skills do you think a person who wants to reflect on this relationship, what skills do they need, what professional training do they need? And the reason I'm saying this is when scientists want to reflect on science and society, and I think some of the most meaningful reflections on science and society have come from scientists over the last century. I mean, there's no doubt about it. But in a changing world in which many different professions studying science have come up, then the question is, what really is the ideal way to reflect on science? What kind of other disciplines do you have to draw upon to reflect on this idea relationship between science and society? And therefore, um, so suppose let's look at it from the other side who are looking at this tribe called scientists. And they say, well, scientists want to retain control of the narrative of science and its relationship to society. I'm not going to use today's time distribution as an example, but one could ask a particular question. One, as I said, the first question which I really want to place before you is how to talk about science without being called anti-science just because we raise questions about we could be raising questions about the epistemological status of science or the social nature of science or the, the way in which science impacts simple things like our roads and pollution and so on. It's, it's, I mean, I can only tell you from a person practicing outside studying science that it's extremely difficult. And just as one extreme example, but very illustrative example, you know, earlier on I was working, I still am very interested in this problem, in philosophy of mathematics, on whether mathematical entities exist or not. It's a very fascinating question. It's a long history, and there are a lot of things you can actually think about and write about it. Now, once when I was somebody, one very well-known scientist once asked me, what, were you, what was I working on at that time? And I explained this particular problem. 
about whether mathematical entities are real, do they exist, what kind of relationship they have, etc. And this person's response is a very well-meaning, I think very open scientist. His response was, he says, Sundar, why are you so anti-mathematics? The point is, it, this is not even a critique, forget about it as being critique of science. It's asking questions of science which does not interest the community of scientists, that's all. And we do this asking the question of science from different perspectives. So you have very big disciplines, long and very uh, professionally established disciplines like history of science, philosophy of science and sociology of science. And very often what the historians, philosophers and sociologists of science talk about science does not seem to penetrate at all to the practicing scientists and in their narrative of science. So I, I could see this, of course, in the what I would call um, as a misreading of my Hindu piece on the science march, but it also was in my response in the wire about it, um, it was also a kind of way to engage in a more meaningful debate and dialogue by showing these particular larger characteristics of what science is and the practice of science constitutes. So, uh, to me, that is a very important question. And therefore, one could ask the question, um, along with science, scientists reflecting on society and talking about society, of which they know, they know a lot about science and they know a lot about society, because in India, some of the most influential policy makers are from the science community, and definitely not from the philosophy community or <laughs> historians and others. So definitely there is a very deep influence on the way the society, at least Indian society has developed in terms of the influence of, the, of scientists. But if we want to ask, if we want to have a say in the way in which science is absorbed, used, negotiated, and perhaps even abused in the larger scientific world, in the larger social, um, in the larger social structures, then how can we engage with you without having to be told that you, know, you are not scientists and scientists are the ones who will have the means of uh, setting the boundaries for the dialogue. So the question is not about whether dialogue is possible or not. What are the stakes and the rules and the boundaries for how we want to conduct a dialogue? And the question we often confront is how do we engage with this question? So for example, and um, again it, it has been uh, been in the web for quite some time for the last few months around this. So let me give you an example of how many of the social scientists reacted to this particular fight which was going on. And this, the standard question the social scientists would ask, or many of them would ask, is this. While scientists try to understand science in terms of a particular kind of a knowledge practice, many people outside science do not reduce it only to a knowledge practice. Of course, knowledge you know, creation of knowledge is something very unique to science and something very special to science. But does science as a larger entity, can it be reduced to just certain kind of ideal forms of knowledge behavior? That is creation of certain kinds of knowledge about the world and so on. And therefore, the, one of the central questions which has been echoing around this group in the last, in the, for a very long time, is this question of asking what is the place of things like class, caste, religion or gender within science. And of course, science and gender, even the academy has been very interested in this, I mean, uh, women in science question, and the larger questions of gender, but what the people who want to look at the relationship of science and society are doing, are bringing in perspectives from their own disciplinary practices and enlarging the way in which we understand science. And I, I mean, in my own work from philosophy of science, I think much of the way in which uh, idealistic practice of science has been given in terms of a very Kuhnian or Popperian um, you know, methods or uh, models, which is really outdated within philosophy of science. And for, for, for us to understand science today, it's so much more as a complex creative act, where, which does not reduce to such simple processes which happened in early post-positivistic phase of creating ideas of what science is. And it is that creative, uh, extremely energetic, conceptual way of thinking about the world which animates the doing of science. And reducing science to certain idealized uh, you know, pictures which really can, do not capture the, the complexity of science does disservice to science. And that's always been my one single argument that much of what you speak of on behalf of science is not true of science, does not fit the rigor of scientific method and temper in your definition of science. So part of our science and society, the first 
I think a very important part of our engagement in science and society is to make the definition of science intrinsically within this larger social world, not reduced to certain kinds of isolated practices. And I think, I mean, it, it's not new. People have been doing it in these disciplines of history, philosophy, and sociology of science. So then, having said that, how then will, should scientists respond to the question of sociality of science? And this is, I think, from their perspective, it's, uh, it's, it's very correct. Why should they be worried about class, caste, gender, and other issues when they are solving an equation or doing something in their experimental labs? Why should that matter to them? Now, we might say, I think, at least speaking on behalf of some of us, we'll say, yes, we will grant you that fact that you're doing something which can be isolated from these particular characteristics. But then, all that we would ask is to say, I mean, all that we would say is this, then don't, you can have that picture and you can restrict yourself to the doing of science in that sense. In, that, in which case, you do not have the final right or authority to speak on science and society. You have the complete authority to speak about what science is practices, what kind of techniques and other things which you do, which creates this kind of a knowledge system. But you have to be a little bit more careful in talking about science and its relationship to larger society. That's all. I mean, in the sense, that's really, therefore, the question of dialogue is inbuilt the very idea of science, in the negotiation of the meaning of science. And as I always, even in the Hindu piece, which uh, the, the only point I was really making is that things which you take for granted like scientific temper or scientific method are themselves the points of contention. If it was so obvious not to outsiders, not to all of us tribals outside the science community, if it was so obvious to all the scientists, then that itself would be a great step forward. And I can just share with you very quickly, um, you know, I think it was at IASC in a meeting where Professor Pushpa Bhargava was there. Uh, I think Professor Arunachalam was also there in one of this meeting there. And he gave this example, which I'm sure many of our scientists here might know. He was talking about this point in the 70s when he tried to get the, the pledge signed for the scientific temper, which he and Professor Satish Dhawan and others wanted to do. And this was his story. This is what he said. Um, he said, we, uh, you know, we were very concerned about the lack of scientific temper. We wrote a, a document. We wanted people to sign it as a pledge that we will all follow scientific temper. And he said, the re and, but it failed. And the reason it failed is because the scientists refused to sign it. He said, because there was, we, what we couldn't do among the group of scientists is to come up with meaningful understanding of what scientific temper was and how we would all be able to invoke that to fight certain kinds of whatever, whatever social ills that you think you are going to do. So I will just therefore conclude by saying, um, the, I think in this reflection on science and society, I think scientists are extremely important. But as partners, you will have to draw upon a very large number of professionally trained historians, philosophers, sociologists. And just as an indication to tell you um, why that has been so difficult, is that in India, we still do not have a full-fledged STS program. You know, there have been attempts at, uh, you know, small parts. We've tried, we've been talking for a long time to start a M MA or MS or whatever you want to call it in philosophy and history and philosophy of science, for example. It's been impossible to actually set up a program which every small country in the world has separate centers, separate programs in history and philosophy and sociology of science. To have established programs in studying science outside the doing of science has been quite impossible in India. Part of the reason could be that the government is uh, it's never not been supporting many things it should support. Two, there's al already been a great suspicion towards these kinds of disciplines. But three, and I'll just leave this point with you, um, that, uh, you know, and this is part of one of the arguments I'd made to DST when I tried to interest them in starting something on history and philosophy of science, is to say uh, having a good culture of study of science through history, philosophy, and sociology of science will actually increase science. It will increase the quality of science which is being done here. I don't know, I mean, people may not buy into this argument, but at least there's a way to try and get them to fund something which they haven't done so far. But the point is this, that it is also true, as many people feel, and I have, you know, some examples of this, that part of the reason why we have found it so difficult to establish science studies programs in a very sustained manner from the undergraduate to postgraduate is also because of the power of the scientific community. and uh, And... And because the scientific community does not think 
that this is a very important, obviously there are other things to do, you have to raise funds for yourself. But I'm saying in the context of the larger power which the scientific community has, we'll have to ask the question, how deeply uh, is their engagement in the support of such uh, institutional, um, you know, in, in creating such institutes, which I think is extremely important. We know, I mean, there are many in this room here, um, you know, scientists who have been very, you know, excellent examples of historians and philosophers of science. But I'm saying as a community, in terms of promoting the creation of science, studying science as a professional discipline, not having opinions on what science is based on their practice, has been extremely difficult to do within the country. And all I can say is, you know, I, I did tell Srikanth that be very polite, but if I can just have one, um, well, it's, it's still a polite comment, but just as an example of an anecdote, uh, perhaps it's a reflection of what, why this is the problem, why this is the case. Um, there were two very good programs in India, which are science institutes, and you know they've been funding very good science institutes in India. And we had tried to, I met two of those people who are very much involved in setting up the social science and humanities. And very interestingly, both of them from different contexts told me when I first met them, they said, well, uh, we are creating a new social science, a new humanities curriculum, a new, whatever, new vision of humanities and social science. Because social science and humanities in India what they basically said is, there is no good social scientist and humanity, humanity scholar in India, so we as scientists have to reimagine and re-envision social science and humanities. And this is a true story. I'm, I'm saying this not as a, as I said, not as a criticism, but as a challenge to us, those of us who want to think that the study of science has to be broadened beyond just the practitioners of science. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Sundar, for your polite interventions. Um, we, we now have, uh, as our next uh, uh, speaker here, uh, Professor Shiv Vishwanathan, uh, who is a social scientist and a professor at Jindal uh, Global Law School and is the director of the Center for the Study of Knowledge Systems at the Jindal Global University. Uh, he holds an adjunct professorship also at the Raman Research Institute, and I believe is visiting or will be visiting uh, often uh, to uh, in, you know, interact with the scientific community there and, and around. around. Uh, he's the author of, uh, again, various books. Uh, many of uh, uh, the ones that I'll mention uh, <clears throat> as, as, as uh, uh, analyses of uh, the scientific process, uh, uh, organizing for science, a carnival for science, essays on science, technology, and development. Um, and uh, he's made uh, important contributions to science and technology studies. Um, he's argued for the recognition of a plurality of knowledge systems uh, and alternative sciences, and uh, uh, his, his name is associated with the, the term cognitive justice, which may or may not come up in his remarks today, uh, which, which captures that uh, notion. Uh, he's a regular columnist to newspapers like the Hindu, the Indian Express, etc. Uh, um, I'm sure many of you have read columns by him uh, on, on a variety of subjects. Uh, his recent book is Theatres of Democracy Between the Epic and the Everyday. So with that introduction, I request Shiv to make it. I wish the seminar had ended with Sundar. Civilized, discreet, sort of sets the right tone for people to go home with a good taste in the mouth. I can't do that. In fact, I was telling Sundar I came to, I think I got a feeling I come to the wrong seminar. I have no complaints about your science. I've never seen a more incomplete democracy than the presentations I heard today. And I think that is the problem. Let's take a man I have great admiration for, go straight in 10 minutes, Balram. Editor of Current Science. He confuses popularization with democracy. And he wants us citizens to believe popularization is democracy just because he cracks two jokes. The joke's on him. Because I think in a deep and fundamental way, we are not asking science to be explained to things simply. 
All I know is when you're on the ground, and this reminds me of something that happened 20 years ago when Satish Dhawan invited me here, uh, a bit more than 20 years ago. And I'd just come from Bhopal when the gas disaster had taken place. And I said, why can't the Institute of Science help us do research on that? And Satish was silent. My question is not whether you do good science. You do good science. Is your good science good for democracy? And how democratic are you? That's what worries me. Because I thought this idea of dialogue is terrific. But there was no notion of dialogue in anything you spoke. You almost have a contempt because you think populism is democracy. Democracy is a dialogue among equals. Let me give you an example. I used to work in, I spent 10 years investigating Narendra Modi. While doing that, I used to work in the Dang area of Gujarat, where many of the tribals came one day to me and said, we want to have a seminar with the scientists. So I said, why me? They said, no, I believe you work on something called science studies. Horrible subject. But they said, no, what we need to be understood is, we don't want to be understood as objects of science. We want to be understood as theoreticians. Because a democracy means my epistemology talks to your epistemology. Not your epistemology has to be simplified so an idiot like me can understand it. That's asymmetry. And I think this point has to be emphasized. Because I think I, you guys can have all the grants you want. But there are three dialogues here which you're not talking about. Because if this is a contribution not just to improving science, but to improving democracy, then you have to raise three sets of issues. A democracy within the scientific group, the conversation between scientists and science policy makers, which seems to haunt you more, and then a conversation between scientists as citizens talking to other citizens. The third part is completely illiterate. Sorry, I can't be as polite as Sundar. Because I think you've got to understand that many of your top scientists have been utterly undemocratic. Let me take names, because this is the only crude way to do it. Raja Ramanna, a man who has accused many dissenting groups of being anti-scientific and anti-national and tried to harass them. I think you've got to confront the fact that during the emergency, many of you scientists stood up for the establishment. And this goes down to even an astrophysicist like Chandrasekhar, who believed the emergency was necessary. What we're not asking for is not an examination of your theory. We're asking for an examination of the democratic assumptions within which you conduct your science. I thought that's what dialogue was about. There's goodwill for it. But where is your notion of citizenship? When you laugh at any question we ask, of course it's funny. Some of the understandings that people have of science is quaint and quixotic. I remember during, I was working in 1999 on the Orissa cyclone. I talked to a group of villagers. They said, tell me, why do you think the cyclone happened? They had a little discussion in their little panchayat and said, pop, sin. So I said, what do you want to do about it? They had another discussion and said, give the scientists a lot of radars. At least when it comes to funding, they're a bit more generous to you than the state. What I'm trying to say is, your dialogue with the people, which your experiment was an attempt to start with, has to go further. Forget Popper and Polanyi. Forget policy documents. What is a scientific experiment and a democratic experiment meet in India. That is the challenge, that is the beauty. I think that's what you were trying to say, that you had pushed it further. You know, I, I was thinking of theatre groups like the one, some of the people now experimenting with Grotowski in theatre. What happens to the body in science? How do you ask questions like that? I think it raises a new kind of experimentation, new sets of questions where science becomes a metaphor for an experiment in citizenship. I think that was the excitement of what you tried to convey. We are not questioning your professionalism. 
We are trying to see how your professionalism can add to the imagination of democracy. In fact, we come with the highest of expectations and I return with the deepest of disappointments. Because it's not about science communication. Let me ask you, which of you actually articulated a communication model which is dialogic? Which gave two minutes to the listener? You laugh at the populace. No problem. The joke's on you. And I think, let me ask now a reverse set of questions. One of the things we're facing most in India is the growing impact of violence. Many of the violence stems from ideas in science, like obsolescence. Think of a thought experiment. How can science save the crafts in India? How can science break the possibility that Indian agriculture is going to be demolished in the next 10 years? You have, what we're just asking is, use that science to give us a more imaginative democracy. We're not complaining about your science. I think that's misleading, it's a red herring. Partly it's because you yourself play the game, which I've seen many of you scientists play, including the much cited Pallav Bagla, of overplaying the nationalism to increase scientific funding. Come on, you're not innocent. You play the political game and then pretend to be politically naive. We are not going to let you do that. I think it's a question of a battle on the streets. And in the battle on the streets, you can't suddenly pretend to be members of the Rotarian Club. Sorry. And so let me reverse the thing. Suppose you were to conduct a play for the other two scientists here. How would you do it? Start with the immobility of the bodies and the immobility of the scripts they use. 19th century metaphors for a 21st century problem. Come on, make each... You all think you are analysts. I think you're case studies. Let's reverse it. Democracy allows me to do it both ways. You think I'm a case study as a kind of unscientific dud. I am. But I think your case studies in a democratic imagination. The failure here today is not your science. Come on, you're all outstanding scientists. Which is why you can pretend to be modest. You're lousy Democrats. And I think democracy is as much an experiment as science. What we are inviting you today is to experiment within the democratic imagination. And the failure is there. Let's take simple examples. I spend a lot of time with social movements. The people who actually add it to the scientific imagination are not you. It's the social movements and science. They brought an imagination. They discussed method. Second most important, I think the most important asset we have in democracy today are dissenting scientists. From Amulya Reddy to C.V. Srishadri. That is the asset we want from you. We won't, we don't want your dominant paradigms in science. We want an Amulya who can stand up to the nuclear establishment. We can have, want a C.V. Seshadri who tried to combine thermodynamics and the Indian constitution. There's a playfulness there. Yes, science is fun, but it allows democracy also to be fun. But you're contemptuous of democracy and citizenship. And if you look at your language and psychoanalyze it, that is the problem. You have all the funding you want. But I think more than funding, what you need is an understanding of science. And that's missing. Because you encourage a kind of idiot like Narendra Modi who say, I want paisa vasool science. Where he confuses science with technology. How come none of you get up and challenge him? He's more moronic in his understanding of science than any of the people you have criticized. Come on, gloves are off. We don't need science studies. Because science studies is occurring and is being experimented and invented on every day in India. In agriculture, in town planning, in all the debates of the crisis of the university. Where are you in all that? 
Those are also knowledge systems. They also have a grandeur of knowledge. So if you want to be classical, be classicist. Apply your canons to a democracy. But if you sit here like kind of dumb-headed Victorians, I'm going to be equally contemptuous. You need a popular course in democracy. Maybe we need a populism of science. Admit it. But as citizens, you're awful. As theoreticians of democracy, you're terrible. And I think it's time that someone gets up to this elite establishment and tells that layoff. The battle on the ground is of a different order. Men are dying, women are being raped, and you're talking about funding in science? What's so important? What's your priority? Can you connect the dramas to make a different kind of story? And I think what we have here is science in India as a failure of storytelling. That's what we are asking you for. We are proud of science. If you go and talk to an ordinary man in the street, he loves science. He might misunderstand it. He might take it partly mythically. But the appreciation he has for you is stunning. The disappointment is not yours, it's his. That you don't see the kind of appreciation he gives to knowledge. Come on, any Indian minute he makes a lecturer himself, he says, Dr. Saab, Panditji, you're already sort of risen in status. The question I'm asking is, how does knowledge become a part of democracy? And nothing in your theories answers that. And I thought dialogue was the beginning of that experiment. But the experiment we conducted is, how can knowledge, and scientific knowledge in particular, add to the democratic imagination? I've heard nothing about that. You have your philosophy of science. Give me five minutes for democracy. Thank you. So before I uh, ask, uh, oh yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, Can I stay where I am? <laughs> Okay. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Now, before I, I uh, ask uh, the, these earlier speakers to respond to uh, some of the comments I've made, uh, that have been made, I, I, I think, uh, okay, let me highlight two points that were, that were raised by Sundar and Shiv, respectively. Uh, one of which is, um, <clears throat> you know, this question about what scientists mean when they talk about science and what others may be talking about and to the extent that both of them have their validity uh, what what is the full picture that all of us should be talking about i think that's one question that 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 deserves to be addressed and the other is um, what is the role of the democratic imagination in the practice of science. What did I say? Democratic. I said, oh, sorry, did I say that? Yeah. Democratic is what I meant, of course. Uh, imagination in the practice of science. I, I, um, I, I would like, uh, like I said, the earlier speakers to respond to both these two points that I would like to highlight and, and, and more uh, generally as they wish. Who would like to go first? You know, having been accused of being the great dictator and uh, not having a democratic bent of mind, I might just comment. I won't comment on Shiv Vishwanathan's uh, rather brutal attack on uh, scientists who spoke here. I think that sort of misread, I think, what the purpose of the meeting was. I think different people had different ideas on what uh, this meeting was supposed to be. This was a launch of a journal. And having been the editor of a journal for a long time, I thought one of the things that I could do is to talk about writing. 
and uh, I won't address the subject of democracy at all. On the other hand, I will address something that Sundar said, and uh, which I think Sundar sort of did have a lament that scientists didn't seem to take science studies very seriously and were often dismissive of it. Now, I would just like to, again, uh, at the risk of being uh, labeled funny, the joke might actually be on me. I'll tell you a joke. Uh, I'll remind you of Richard Feynman's famous comment on uh, historians and sociologists of science. He said they were about as useful to scientists as ornithologists are to birds. So now it turns out that ornithologists do appreciate birds and the various things that birds do. But birds often don't have any idea of what the ornithologists are doing. So maybe scientists are yet to appreciate what studies of science can do for them and how important it is to look at that subject. It, this might, in fact, be useful in uh, many, many ways. So I think uh, that's going to take a while to come, and maybe experiments like dialogue might help in that direction. Well, I think that um, the presentations have been very interesting. And um, to start with what uh, Dr. Shri Vishwanathan said, I sort of agree with him in the following sense. I do think that uh, uh, many scientists often think that whatever they're doing is so esoteric that it really either can't be or need not be uh, transmitted to other people or that it's not worth their time to spend on it. Um, of course, I'm not capable of as strong language as he is, but what I was trying to say when I talked about obligations or something similar, I do think that science has an obligation to society, if only because it is that society which has supported science, directly or indirectly. And I think an attitude where we say, well, we've had, we've had the support, and uh, I do think that the scientific community quite often thinks large number of people, not everybody, that um, we are entitled to that support automatically. And after that support is given, nobody has the right to ask us. I think that attitude must change. And if that is partly what um, he has in mind as uh, democratizing, I'm actually all for it. And I, I do think that uh, when I spoke about obligations, this is the sort of thing that I had in mind. I think scientists have an obligation to society. After all, the money may come from the government, but the government has no money of its own. It's the people's money that the government has. And to that extent, we are responsible to the people, and we have to be able to tell them what we are doing with that money, and we have to be able to try and communicate with them. Well, I do think there have been scientists who have tried to do that. They do go around villages and try and talk about it. But that effort, I think, is still far too small. But I would also like to say that the very fact that this journal is being supported by the academy is, in a sense, a recognition. Too weak, I think, for uh, Dr. Vishwanathan. I can, I can understand his viewpoint. But I do think it's a recognition that we have failed in one of the things that we should have done, and that our obligation to society is something that we should, therefore, um, express by carrying on by carrying on this conversation and during that conversation I think that we must be we must be prepared for them to ask all kinds of questions let me give only one personal example, I, it's only because I, it's personal and I know exactly what happened well I've spent a lot of time in the Center for Atmospheric Sciences uh, when I was at the Institute and uh, we started a little program to talk about weather with peasants. And we went to a village, because we all had to speak in Kannada. And we had to, it was actually a dialogue with the peasants there. And we had some 20 or 30 people. 
And it was actually a very interesting uh, conversation. And I would say that the questions that they asked were actually very relevant. And it had to do with how far we could, we could give them help. And the group of people that were there speaking to them, Sulajana Gadgil was there, for example, talking about the monsoons. First of all, we said we must speak in their language. And so we had the metadata for that village, for that area. Uh, all in language which they understood, which is rainfall by nakshatras. If you go to your peasant, you can't say, you know, it's, it's, they go by how much rainfall do we get in Hasta? <laughs> Hasta Mada Yashwar. So all these things were converted. And we said, you know, this is what the scientists say. Does that check with your experience? And uh, very often, they understood it. And I must say that after a while, the conversation certainly was what they thought was something that they could understand. And one of them, who was a, was a remarkable man, I'm sorry to say that he had to sit a little outside because he was not quite acceptable to the rest of the community there. But he was supposed to be the best farmer among all of them, most successful. And at the end, he said, um, so I asked him, and he said, Chanagitu, sir, we had Madhavakram Ghelvakut. Then there was a farmer who was uh, richer, at 30 acres, and he said, I like what you're saying. If you agree, I will leave three crores to three, three acres of land for you to tell me what I should do. You make an experiment, I will carry it out for you. So my own experience with, uh, my own my experience is not very large, I must also say, but my own experience whenever I had that uh, opportunity has been that, that even farmers who may know nothing about formal meteorology or science at all are very receptive if you talk to them, if you make an attempt, if you, even if you make an attempt to talk to them in their language. About um, Dr. Sarukai's comments, I only have one, one thing to say there, or two, two points. One is about history. I think that uh, the comments that uh, Sundar made about the reluctance of, uh, of scientists, of the scientific community, to support Centers for the History of Science, I don't think it's limited to science. On the whole, it would seem to me that compared to other civilizations, India has not been particularly, uh, not, not set great value by history. Uh, it's not as if we had our political histories, all right, or uh, the history of India over the last, after all, it goes back at least 2,500, sorry, at least 3,500 years. We really don't know those histories very well at all. And it's never been actually considered something that should be done. I think the explanation was given by Mahatma Gandhi once. And he was, somebody was talking to him about history and so on. He said, well, you know, I'm not so sure about history. History is divisive, he said. Whatever lessons I expect to learn from history, I learn from reading the Ramayana and Mahabharata. Mahabharata, you see, Ramayana is a kavya. Mahabharata is itihasa. Mahabharata is saying, this is what happened. Not in every detail, but it was supposed to reflect. It was supposed to reflect what actually happens in the world. So, you know, you, you don't find too many history books in Sanskrit. Sanskrit has a full of literature, poetry, drama, science, mathematics, technology, and so on but not much that I know of in history. That's number one. Number two, I think the thing which you mentioned about uh, Dr. Pushpa Bhargava and Satish Dhawan is the same event as the one that I talked about. Um, because I don't know of another one, uh, going back to Satish Dhawan's time. And that took place sometime in the late 60s, I think. That's, I'm, I'm not absolutely sure about the date, but around that time. And it is true, as I said, the statement was made. It was signed by many people, including me and uh, Satish Dhawan. And um, it was circulated. It came in that magazine. But uh, he's quite right. I don't think it really had any big effect on, on thinking about uh, the 
problems. Uh, and in terms of the scientific attitude. I would only, however, reiterate that I think when we talk about the scientific attitude, I agree, it should be democratic. And um, it, it helps to talk in language with concepts that they're already familiar with. This is a large conclusion to draw from a few encounters with peasants in a certain part of Karnataka. But I found that when you do that, the response is actually very different. And um, I think the mistake we are making in the rationalist movement in India is not rationalism. It is that we do not relate it to our past. We do not relate it to our culture. And people think that rationalism is something which has come from the West and is therefore something new to us. It's not true. As I said earlier, and I've uh, written about the subject with uh, references to chapter and verse, and I'd be very happy to share it with anybody who has any interest in it. Uh, the Indian attitude was rational. It's not the same, however, as Greek rationalism. It had a different character. It didn't, for example, believe that you could go from axioms to proofs, and that was truth. Indian philosophers never accepted it, as I see Indian philosophy. You are an expert. You should tell me that if you had axioms, are the axioms truth? How do you know? It is a fact that Greeks sometimes use funny axioms and got funny results. And as I say, India believed in number more than in geometry. Sorry, thank you. Um, so I, was, I hoped I conveyed in my talk the, the point of view of switching over to listening the importance of not being self-serving, the primacy of non-scientists in this whole process, and the fact that one should see oneself as a citizen first and not as a scientist. Now, but to interpret your point of view, my admitting that all these are problems doesn't let me off the hook. Uh, and if I take that point of view, and are there vested interests? Have we been bought off? We enjoy this, uh, this position that society has given to us and it, uh, therefore increased responsibility apart from just admitting these problems. And my response to you or appeal to you is that it's taken me a long time to even come to this point of view in an amateurish way. And I think the, 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 the rigor and professional training of the social scientists, sciences and humanities, which enable you to reach such conclusions more quickly, is something which I miss in my own training. And I think it's something which uh, if we started a dialogue, we would come to those conclusions much more quickly. Okay. Um, thank you. So I, I would like to now open the floor uh, for discussion uh, with audience questions. I request anybody who has a question to raise their hand and, and uh, before you start, mention who the question is addressed to primarily. Huh? Huh? And, and also who you are. And by the way, I'm told that I forgot to uh, um, mention who I was um, <laughs> in the opening <laughs> sessions. Uh, I, I did omit that. I'm Shrikan Shastri from JNCASR. And, and uh, yeah, just identify yourself, say who the question is for, and ask. Uh, my name is Karthik. I work in an obscure little place in this institute called the Archives and Publications Cell. Um, this question is addressed to watchers of science, journalists of science, and also practitioners of science. Three very quick points. The first two are concerns. Uh, they may seem trivial, but I do believe that they have some large implications. Sorry? Uh, all of the, Anybody who's interested in taking this, maybe the science journalist. Sorry, I'm putting you on the, uh, on the spot here. Um, so... One of the th things that happens, especially in India, is that what passes off as science journalism are, st are stories based on individual studies. And I think that's a pretty big problem because uh, most scientists will tell us that um, you can get a significant result for a study simply by virtue of chance alone, especially due to... Uh, I'll try to be as succinct as I can. Um, but we do know that there are problems with individual studies because you get statistical significance due to chance or data mining, things like that. Or you can get a, you can interpret a study simply based on a p-value of 0 
0.045 as opposed to 0 0.055, and there'll be completely different interpretation. So I think we push, put too much faith on individual studies. Um, I'll, I'll skip the third point I wanted to make, but there's... Sure. If there is time, I'd like to... Probably not, because... Yeah, I apologize for rushing everybody, but uh, we should probably finish in about 15 minutes or so, so I request... I mean, I would like to get through as many comments and, and, and questions as possible, but keep it brief and as well as, uh, you know, your responses. So, Seema, why don't you take that and say... So your question is that why uh, stories are mostly based on single publication and... Yeah, so this is again, as I was saying, you know, it's the more, and if you see that most of the publications are Western journals, you know, that the stories in, in, in Indian publication that you see, it's like, you know, the demand and supply. So your supply is so sort of well-oiled that it comes straight in your inbox. So it's, it's lazy journalism, it's lack of, uh, lack of training on the part of the writer, lack of attention on the part of the editor. So that's, that's the mainstream media uh, uh, thing. And because it comes very tailor-made in the, you know, in email every week from all the journals, Nature Science and all that. So that's like pop science that is being, uh, uh, that is being promoted. Uh, hello, I'm Guru Raja uh, from SRISTI, as well as from Guppy Labs. Uh, my question is to uh, both science, scientists as well as science journalists. Uh, what is the language of dialogue over here? Is it that, uh, is that the English? Or it's that what the society asks for? Okay, I'm keep losing track. So who was the question for? Both. Six people. Both scientists and science journalists. No, no. So, yeah, who, who wants to take that question? Open question, yep. Okay, so um, yeah, there was a hand here. Brief comments, and, okay? Yeah. This is more in the nature of a comment. Um, I largely agree with what Shiv and Sundar said, but I think Shiv's comments were not just incendiary, they were misleading. Um, and to give one example, Satish Dhawan was not the director here in 1984 after Bhopal. He retired as a director in 1981. Yeah, I know, but yeah, but it's misleading to that extent. Um, and incidentally, you may not be aware of this, he encouraged both his daughters to go and protest against the Sardar Sarova Dam and the project. One of them happens to be a scientist. Um, secondly, I was quite surprised that a few years ago, you were on a panel along with me at NIAS on bioethics, where you took off, until then you were completely quiet, because someone mentioned the name Feynman. I was quite surprised that when Professor Balram mentioned Feynman, there was no reaction on your face. <laughs> oh, I don't have to leave here. <laughs> okay, so uh, just yeah. two quick remarks. One, uh, you know, I, uh, pointing to scientists as, the, uh, as somehow uniquely uh, to blame in not democratizing knowledge, I think is to miss the fact that this is just part of the failure of us as a nation to educate our people in general. Okay. Second point I want to make, which is uh, insisting on talking about a dichotomy or a confrontation between traditional epistemologies and uh, modern ones, is completely failing to miss the enormously liberating nature of scientific knowledge, which allows individuals to go and find out for themselves, which pulls them out from the morass of traditional wisdom which has oppressed them. That's all I want to say, thank you. My question is to Shiv Vishwanathan Sharathya. Uh, Shiv, are you, uh, uh, when you say uh, the, the democratization, do you actually mean uh, it in the sense of what Firabin 
uh, proposed as uh, signs in a free society where all epistemologies are sort of competing with each other. It's a kind of a relativism of knowledge. Is that what you mean or uh, what is it that you are trying to get at? So, um, Why don't you do this? It's a very specific question. Yeah. is a bad example. The democratic theorist in the family was his wife and girlfriend, Grazia Borini. I think you want to understand that Parapen has an anarchist idea of knowledge, not a democratic one. See, what I'm trying to say is we have to push further. I admire the fact that you're saying that obligations are necessary. The question is, what is the nature of the obligation? How do you work it out into a social contract? I think that becomes important. Uh, like one of the attempts you're making recently, a lot of the tri groups working with tribal movements in India are trying to get nature into the constitution. You're going to need your help. Not the messy way in which the BJP government did it. By saying only certain things which are Hindu and sacred are therefore natural. So what I'm trying to say is we have to push the experiments in democracy from the experimental table into the constitution. We have come to the second stage. I'm not going to accuse you of uh, lacking bona fide. You have the bona fides. The question is, how far do we push democracy? Absolutely germane to this. I wanted to ask this a little earlier. I am slightly confused as to why exactly you think that scientists have a huge role to play in pushing democracy in this sense. Love some clarification. But uh, can, can I just take two more questions? Then we stop. Sorry, and then uh, you people respond. Yeah, here's one. And yeah. Good evening to one and all. Narasimha Purohit is my name. I am B computer science engineer. 2016 pass out. No, just make it brief. Huh? That sounds. Yeah, you said to introduce. <laughs> no, that's no, why no. I said. Yeah. No, no. You should identify yourself. But go ahead. Okay. My question is especially to Sundar sir. Since a fraction of your speech passed by the way of human psychology, that made me to ask this question. Many people who speak alone are called soliloquic, and I am one among them. Uh, uh, my friends used to call me mad, but uh, till, till now they do it, but I won't care. And uh, it so happened once, and uh, to be very frank and true with you all, it's uh, once I was questioned uh, in traveling in a bus, that made a different issue, and I cleared it off. So I want your opinion on what is this uh, thing that makes uh, one person to speak alone when he is uh, thinking of something. Uh, my name is Prajwal Shastri. I'm an astrophysicist. Uh, for Dr. Saroka and Dr. Vishnathan, I just uh, want to say thanks for raising all your thoughts in this forum. I think that's uh, excellent. Uh, I just had a minor answer to Dr. Singh's question, in a way, uh, where you asked if 10% of uh, spending 10% of a scientist's time in engaging with the public, is that a reasonable demand and uh, you know, would scientists be too busy? Uh, those of us, I think the others would concur with me, those of us who worked with uh, engaging with the public, especially in the vernacular, where we have the privilege of uh, a much more alive audience, uh, I think we would say that 10% is not just reasonable, it becomes less than 10% because it actually uh, deepens our own uh, understanding of our uh, disciplines, just like any teacher would tell you that teaching deepens one's understanding. Okay, so let me uh, request, uh, maybe starting with Shiv, because he stopped mid-sentence, so to speak, uh, and, and we just have each one of you say whatever in response you wish to, and then I think that's closing time. I'm glad you asked the question, but I think democracy in India faces a particular challenge. One, how do you keep tribal groups alive instead of eliminating them? And a lot of that elimination is done in the name of science or progress. What we need today is a new kind of social compact between tribal knowledge, peasant knowledge, and what we call modern industrial scientific knowledge. In that sense, the development of India is going to be different. That needs a different kind of pluralism. It also needs a different kind of time. Linear historical time won't work for that. So, in fact, one of the things social movements have tried to introduce is the plurality of time into the constitution, whereby we can, to a certain extent, 
and make sure that these groups aren't eliminated. So, uh, so actually, uh, sorry, let me. Uh, uh, in fact, this is a theme that I was talking to Professor Nasima about uh, a little while ago in a slightly different context. One could ask the question, uh, is it too late to go back and retrieve these other sort of uh, knowledge systems and ways of uh, analyzing the world? Uh, or do you, okay, you don't think so? I think there's tremendous things, first, available in the archives. Two, this debate has been going on. This idea of a pluralistic knowledge system, which my friend there talked about, Captain Srinivas Murthy's 1923 report on indigenous medicine argues just that in probably as sophisticated a way as possible. There are a lot of anthropological work being done. I think what you've got to do is to understand what is the relation between knowledge and democracy in these cases and push it. I think a lot of the anecdotes put here together would give you a richer theory of democracy and science. Um, well, just a quick uh, point, um, just also to uh, respond to Professor Balram. Uh, what you say is very true. I mean, the fact that the, the presence of these other ways of understanding science um, might help scientists, but I think I'm going beyond that. In the context of science and society, in the larger ways in which the social the ideas of society are going to respond to the ideas of science, their understanding of science has to draw upon this complex understanding including the fact that histories are seen very differently in our society and so on. So it's much more important that those who are responding to the questions of di debate and dialogue from scientists actually have, in fact, if scientists don't have this uh, refined knowledge about science which other communities have, it would be lead to a far better dialogue because I, it, this hegemony which she was talking about cannot exist because people can come back to these scientists and say, what, your view of science does not match with the larger complex understanding. So I'm extending it, uh, you know, away from that in the context of the science and society. Because I think part of the, you know, the non-democratic thing which she has been talking about was also so clearly uh, manifested in this whole debate which has happened with this, uh, you know, scientific temper, the, the so-called superstition, science as a bulwark against superstition and so on. And th there's been a lot of kind of looking down on people and their ways of making sense of the world in very many different ways. So I'm not saying, therefore, that, um, you know, just because they do HPS and they immediately understand it, but at least we'll understand the complexity of society in ways which is very different from that of the scientists. And the final point is that, um, for, for, you know, if you ask a scientist how to read the social processes, very often they tend to read social processes like they would read uh, natural processes. And that's always been a big problem. Again, you see this repeatedly in the public debates on trying to understand very complex social processes in terms as they would read, uh, you know, natural processes. And I think that itself has a very intrinsic problem. I'd just like to follow up on one comment which was made here, which I think was both improper and incorrect. And this was the reference to the Bhopal gas disaster, which happened in December of 1984. And I was very much here at that time. And as you said, Satish Thawan was not the director, but the then director general of the ICMR did come to Bangalore. There was a meeting held here. There was discussions on analysis to find out what the sample that leaked on that night was. The Indian scientific establishment was not very strong then in these methods. Whatever was available was tried. Dr. Sri Ramachari, who was the additional director general of the ICMR, kept coming all the way till the early years of 2005, 6, 7, 8, until he passed away. And sample analysis was still going on. But one must realize when one makes these harsh indictments of, uh, of uh, Indian science also calling into I happen to head the institution three decades later but I must defend the institution from this these things were done but one should also understand the context in which science was being done here none of the analytical methods which existed which could be used in America were in vogue uh, in India at that time the instrumentation did not exist 
and things could not be done at that time. Much of this, I think we are confusing in some of these our current antipathy to existing establishments with a lot of things which have also gone on uh, uh, in the past. But I think the academy's purpose should be very clear. The academy is trying to bring out a new journal. Bringing out a new journal, and I say this as an editor of a journal, and Seema has correctly pointed out that an online journal is going to put much greater stress on the editor to be up to date. There are an enormous number of clerical things to be done in running a journal, especially a journal which is continuously on the web. Now, journals must focus on articles that they're going to receive. They are not going to solve every social problem in India which is there today. I don't think that was, in fact, the purpose of it. May I have equal time? Nobody said Satish was director. The question we asked you when we came here to the meeting at the Institute of Science was, can you stand in solidarity with us? You didn't. You think a scientific answer to a scientific question is only science. I think it involves a deeper sense of solidarity with what happened. Scientists failed miserably on that. How much evidence do you want? I spent 10 years in Bhopal investigating it. You want to match your science to my science? I'm ready. Fact to fact. But if you want to make the question about the tenuousness of our research, we'll take you head on. Because, let me finish. Because I think we have to answer the question of institutions here. Satish was a bit more modest than you. He said, Shiv, we failed. I think it's time you accept the fact that many of your scientific institutions fail to stand up to major issues in the crisis of science and technology in India. There's nothing wrong with it. So let me, let me actually probably wrap it up, and, and maybe Ram has a word to say. On this show, I think Professor Balram didn't say that there was a successful engagement of the Indian Institute of Science. He did say that they didn't have the necessary wherewithal to actually do what was needed to be done, uh, which I guess amounts to the same thing as what uh, Satish Dhawan said. So I think uh, that argument we can close. But, but perhaps... Um, um, I, I, I think, you know, I, one thing that has come up again and again, at least to me, listening to all the different people here, is that we are, in fact, uh, talking about very different things when we think we're talking about the same uh, enterprise. And I think uh, this conversation, as, as Mukun said, you know, it took him a certain amount of time to have... Uh, an amateurish understanding of issues that maybe the people outside the scientific uh, community are talking about. Uh, uh, I, I, I hope the journal as a platform, without taking any uh, 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 prior positions on, on, on uh, issues, will serve the purpose of dialogue. And that's, that's my hope. I'm sure that's the hope of Ram. And, and uh, he's going to uh, say something in closing of the panel discussion. And then I request uh, Professor Durga Das to give the vote of thanks. No, I, my main thing really was to thank the panelists who have been here and those of you who have stayed here till, the, uh, till almost the bitter end as you have made it. Uh, sure. um, no, you see, um, I mean, it is really heartening to see so many people here, and this tells us that what we are trying to do with dialogue is extremely important. I hope that we will have multiplicities of opinion. I hope that we will have debate, and I hope that what you bring to this kind of a platform will be a serious engagement, not of science and scientists as a divide on science versus society or what have you, these are our problems and we need to solve them. We need to do that by talking with rather than at and hearing uh, and listening and hopefully responding. Now can I request Durgadas to formally thank... Uh... Sorry, one quick uh, announcement before that because I was prompted uh, to do... do uh, prompted uh, uh, on this. The, the journal will actually be launched in January 2018. 
and uh, that will also be the time uh, when we begin to uh, accept submissions, P publish. So we can do that. Is, is the system in place? Yeah. Okay. So uh, yeah, I, yeah. So the submissions. Uh, begin to be accepted starting tomorrow, I uh, stand corrected. Um, the email ID is dialogue at iaas.ac.in. Uh, so please do think of uh, uh, submitting to the journal, but also if you have any thoughts and suggestions and comments, uh, write to that address and uh, uh, your feedback will be shared.